So hi, as Peter said, I'm Liz Crane. I'm currently the Director of Partnerships and Special Projects at Art Place America. Um, I want to thank Waterfire for uh, for inviting us and for all the great work that you do. And Barnaby and Peter, um, you know, all of the all of the support and all the things that you guys do. It's just it's it's amazing. We're we're forever impressed with with Waterfire um, and Providence. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to be here. Um, so. For those of you who may not be as familiar with ArtPlace, uh, we're a collaboration of 13 leading national and regional foundations around the country and six of the nation's largest banks. Uh, we were formed to help accelerate the creative placemaking movement. Um, and uh, thus far, we've served primarily as a grant maker in that space. Um, we're entering into our fourth year of grant making. Uh, to date, we've awarded over $42 million and 134 grants around the country. Um, as a plug, our next grant application cycle uh, is currently open. So uh, the deadline is December 13th. Um, there's a lot of information on our website, uh, slash LOI, or Place America slash LOI, uh, if you want more information on that. Um, but uh, I'm not going to go too much into sort of what Art Place is and what we do, because I want to talk a little bit more about, I think, the, the moment that we're in right now. Um, and so before I introduce our, our panel, um, this is sort of a, an update on where we are as an initiative and a bit of a sneak, sneak peek. Um, so we were formed back in 2011 um, by this partnership of, of national and, and regional foundations uh, who believed essentially that art can play a powerful role in placemaking. Uh, over the last three years, uh, we've participated in the growing creative placemaking movement as a large grant maker and as, as a sort of startup spark to demonstrate that this work is happening, uh, increase the number and funding of projects, inspire new practitioners, uh, begin forming a network and contributing to a common language for the work and thinking about outcomes. Um, we're really excited <laughs> about how much attention and traction we've seen for this work, not only in the arts world, but actually among placemakers of all types around the country. And I think that aspect of this work is only going to grow the sort of infiltration that we're going to be able to do um, into a much wider set of practice. Um, so in the last few months, we've actually been in a bit of a leadership and programmatic transition, uh, taking stock of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, and as a self-appointed creative placemaking geek, I'm really excited to tell you that exciting things are happening. <laughs> um, I've been joking that I'm sort of walking around everywhere and saying, exciting things are happening. Um, you know, I think there was, we, when we sort of went through this strategic planning process, we kind of, um, you know, there's a bit of a hole, I think, in communications coming out. And so this is, we're coming out. <laughs> Exciting things are happening, everything. Um, so uh, in a very short time, we actually expect to make some major announcements about new leadership and new strategies for the initiative. Um, we're a little just slightly short with this event, unfortunately, um, to actually get into all those things. But that, um, that information will, will be coming out fairly soon. Um, and while I can't reveal any of those specific contents, uh, the general gist is that we're moving from our sort of startup phase into a new phase that will be characterized much more um, by sort of a greater investment in the field, um, including and beyond our grant making. Um, so the new director will be the one to actually define that agenda. So uh, I can't offer, again, a lot of um, concrete constructs for, um, for what we're going to be looking at moving forward. Um, but I, I want to sort of tease out some ideas and some areas of exploration. Um, so what does all this mean in the context of metrics, um, given that that's the sort of overlying theme of this, of this event? So we spent a lot of time this morning laying out many different ways of looking at this work and thinking about this work. Um, and we think these conversations are really critical. And we're now in a stage with sort of a large enough grant pool at ArtPlace, um, where ArtPlace can begin moving from the sort of theory building and celebration of practice into a more analytical case-based approach to studying what's actually happening in the, in the places that we're investing. Uh, we did release a set of vibrancy indicators, uh, as we called them, uh, last fall. Um, and they're often characterized, I think, as art places evaluation metrics. But I want to be careful about thinking about them that way. Um, they're one way that art place has thought about measuring changes in the neighborhoods where we invest. <laughs> so it's important to note the indicators do not define what vibrancy is. Um, that's not 
that it's not like these 10 things that we've laid out as indicators are what means that a community is vibrant. Um, and they don't intend at all to replace the sort of project-specific outcomes and evaluation tools. Like Jason was saying, you know, it's really important to think about evaluation in the context um, and the intention of the project. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so instead, the vibrancy indicators are really signals that help to indicate that places may be changing over a period of time. They're this sort of triangulation of, of things that are changing that, that suggest that, that other changes may be happening. Um, and they're selected in many ways because of the fact that they're um, available. Um, and we, as Jason said, we don't, we don't want to put the onus of measuring changes um, for this larger portfolio onto the individual projects. Um, so the idea of get, having this data come from, from these data sets is that it's something that we can pull that's national, uh, nationally available for all communities. Um, however, <laughs> we know they're not the total picture, um, and certainly, again, not the most important to projects thinking about impact on the ground. Um, there are a range of instrumental, normative, and intrinsic outcomes related to this work that can be unpacked not only in the sort of absolute terms, um, but as they relate to the many contexts in which this work takes place. So whether we're talking about rural or urban places, central cities or low-income neighborhoods, um, whether we're talking about changing the future of a disinvested neighborhood, uh, helping a community uh, move past a tipping point, uh, deepening connections and, and meaning in an otherwise actualized place, you know, this, this sort of speaks to that question about, about rural impact earlier today. It is different in different places. Um, so in this sense, I think that the context of the work uh, is part of what's going to help define the metrics for measuring the outcomes of the work. And I want to I make sure um, in the next couple of days that we're talking about metrics and we're not using indicators to mean metrics because indicators and metrics are, are indicators are a kind of metric, but they're not... Um, they're not all metrics. Indicators are sort of a, a sense of a way, again, to sort of triangulate um, and proxy data of, of things that may be changing over time. Um, but what I think is, is the core to us um, at the heart of the Art Place America initiative is that the environments that we live in um, play an important role in shaping us as people in society. Uh, and arts and culture can play an important role in shaping the meaning of the place and the types and amounts of activities that happen in a place. Um, so for us, uh, the way that Art Place thinks about it, creative placemaking uh, is about the intentionality of sort of saying that we want to do this thing here and something will change in the place that we're working. Um, indeed, I think we think arts are, are uniquely positioned to drive certain types of community connections and investments in place. And I'm not just talking about the sort of monetary investments, um, although that's a piece of it. And I, I don't think we want to sort of eschew the economic impact altogether but also thinking about investments up here and investments in here and the attachments to place. Um, so we've already been informally exploring the different ways of looking at this work. Uh, we can separate out projects by tactics. Um, for example, arts incubators, pop-up retail strategies, performances in non-traditional spaces. Uh, we can think about projects as far as strategies, like commercial corridor revitalization, um, enhancement of the connective tissue between nodes of activity, uh, maximization of transportation investments, activation of space. Uh, and we can separate projects by intended outcomes, um, you know, new economic and business opportunities, a uh, stronger civic brand or shared identity and attachment to place, um, better functioning or more innovative governance. Um, and then there's always the larger impact, which is, I think, what all of these things are driving towards. Um, and what do we want to see in a place to make it, as a society and as people, to make it more meaning and functional? And how do the arts contribute to that? So what I think, what it's important to realize, I think for us, what creative placemaking is, this concept that I feel everybody's struggling with, creative placemaking, this new term, umbrella thing that's wrapping its arms around this, this set of practice, um, how we're defining it isn't necessarily as important as what it does. <laughs> so we want to catalyze this creative placemaking movement, not around creative placemaking as a thing and sort of a specific, um, a specific sort of uh, set, a definitional thing, but, but really around what it is that the arts do and can do. Um, 
So I know, you know, we're really looking forward to actually working with the rest of the field and figuring out some of these things um, and ultimately hoping to leave a legacy of better development strategies and, and more meaningful invested places for people. Um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in this new phase. Uh, you know, we're looking at all sorts of things from maximizing the potential of current practitioners to broadening the number of practitioners um, to creating an enabling environment for this work and really understanding all of the things that happen to make um, creative placemaking possible, um, or at least breaking down the barriers of things that are stopping creative placemaking strategies from being as effective as they could be. Um, and just a general understanding of when, why, and how the arts can interact with the physical and the psychological place to enhance its future. Um, so we look forward to being one entity amongst many entities, clearly, that are, that are doing this work and, and thinking about this work um, and exploring what's possible. And so I think this, this new phase, again, sort of from this, this startup where we've, we've had, um, you know, we've just been barreling forward in this train and we've sort of taken a breath and now, now it's time to sort of really think about what are all the different sort of angles and possibilities and ways that we can begin um, working with, with practitioners, researchers, thinkers, everybody, um, to make sure that, that we're creating um, better places and, and supporting the arts in doing that. Um, so with all that being said, I think the, the hard work is always really being done on the ground. <laughs> um, as much as we hem and haw and worry um, about the things we do up here, um, it's nothing <laughs> compared to actually doing the change work on the ground. So um, to that, I'm, I've actually brought a couple of our grantees here um, to share how folks, and specifically I, I, I invited two sets of grantees or, or a few people that are, are not from the arts world. So I wanted to, to share how I think um, people from the place side of the game are employing creative placemaking strategies and working with the arts and artists to change not only the places that they're working in, but the way they even think about doing the work that they do um, in this sort of place-based game. Um, so the first speaker is going to be Kimberly Driggins from the DC Office of Planning, talking about their Art and Culture Temporiums project, uh, and more broadly, how creative placemaking strategies have changed how their office thinks about community planning and engagement. Uh, and the second presentation will come from Max McCarthy, who's with the Upham's Corner Main Street, and Lori Lobenstein, who's with the Design Studio for Social Intervention, uh, on everything happening in Upham's Corner, Boston. Uh, following their presentation, I'm going to moderate a quick discussion uh, between uh, the panelists, and then we can take some questions and, um, you know, to the extent we have time, get into some of these issues. While these folks are talking and presenting on their projects, um, I do want folks to be thinking about a few specific things that I'm hoping to sort of will become unearthed by, um, by what they're going to be talking about. One is we, we have sort of natural placemakers here, planners, main streets, designers. Um, you know, think about how the arts have been uniquely valuable to their agenda as they're talking about their work. Um, I think in, in what ways are they incorporating arts elements and activities sort of as they are um, versus really employing the arts as tools and using place as the content for the arts activity that's happening? Um, and then what are the different kinds of outcomes that they're reaching for as placemakers? Um, and then after the panel, hopefully, we'll, um, we'll sort of look back at those, those questions in relation to, to what you all have talked about. Um, so with that said, I'm going to have Kimberly, invite Kimberly to come up. Again, my name is Kimberly Driggins, and I'm the Associate Director for Citywide Planning. Um, in the DC Office of Planning. And I'm gonna talk about um, our Art Place grant, but before I do that, um, I think it's important just to sort of set the context and give you a little bit of background about our office um, that really um, will help connect the dots in terms of how we've um, been able to utilize the Art Place grant and some of our placemaking efforts. So um, just a little bit about Washington, DC, um, before I start is, we're a city that's growing. Between 2000 and 2012, we gained over 60,000 residents. That was followed by, or that, that, there was previous five decades of population decline from 1950 to 2000. So we're in a boom, um, and much of this growth has taken place over the last two years. The city grew um, 
from 601,000 residents to 632,000 between 2010 and 2012. That's um, astronomical growth, and D.C. hasn't seen this type of growth um, at this pace since the 1940s. Uh, in the office, uh, what I do, one of the main things is um, economic development strategy, and we've embarked upon um, several studies that really look at place. I think the one that's most relevant here is um, a few years ago, we had an idea that we had a burgeoning um, creative sector in Washington. Washington really isn't known as a creative town, but you know that's really sort of the, the that's a that's an underground story that's becoming more and more well known. People know things like the Kennedy Center as well as the Smithsonian, and we have some iconic sort of cultural institutions. But there was also something else that was happening at the local level. And um, we embarked upon the Creative DC Action Agenda back in um, 20, uh, 2009, 2010. And the Creative uh, DC Action Agenda examined the economic significance of our creative economy, as well as help define it and outline strategies to strengthen it. The district is the district's creative base includes um, building arts, design, film and media, communication, communications, performing and visual arts, museum management, and the culinary arts. The DC Creative Action Agenda frames the district in a new light as a top tier creative class or creative city where, creative, um, where creativity and talent combine to enliven neighborhoods, contribute to the um, overall economic stability, and create um, an even more distinctive sense of place. The study found that there were more than 75,000 direct jobs um, in the district's creative sector, and it generated more than, and it generates more than five billion, that's B, billion dollars in income each year. These jobs amount to more than 10% of the city's employment base, and many of these jobs are in media, culinary, museum, and design industries. We also found that there were jobs at every economic level. So um, the city in particular, as we look to strengthen um, um, our job base, and so the region as a whole has a really low um, employment rate. But the city, the district proper, actually has a fairly high um, unemployment rate. It was hovering around 8 to 10 percent over the last few years. So one of the key strategies for the mayor was to really help drive that unemployment number down. And um, we found that the creative arts was a really important sector because it provided livable wages um, that didn't require a, a college degree. So the, um, the politicians actually kind of took note um, with this study and really took a keen interest in it. The city um, office of planning, so in around 2010, really 08, 07, with the economic downturn, we started thinking about how to use our assets and how to think about our assets more intensely and more creatively. We, um, uh, we branded this initiative called Temporary Urbanism, and really it's about activating vacant and underutilized space and really thinking about how we can transform land um, and vacant space to uh, create positive, productive, enlivening uses. Um, creating a system to address vacancy on a citywide scale. The Temporary Urbanism Program provided us with that opportunity. Um, some of the benefits, the benefits to the district and neighborhoods were really sort of street enlivening uses, neighborhood buzz and promotion, new activities, products, art, recreation, and uh, resident and visitor participation. Benefits to property owners included uh, a cultivated consumer interest in their property, maintaining visibility in a location, and engaging community in a positive way. And benefits to temporary users um, included uh, a venue to launch new products and test ideas before going um, uh, full force into the market, um, to highlight and showcase arts um, and performances, and to, to really kind of think about innovation. So we branded our, our temporary um, urbanism initiative. The first project out the gate was actually a temporium project. And, you know, it's a tempor temporary emporium. And, you know, it's really sort of our, our, our definition for pop-up. And 
I mentioned our Creative DC Action Agenda, but we also did another study that looked at our retail environment. And even though we're growing, we're um, severely under-retailed in the district. We lose about $1 billion of retail leakage to the suburbs every year. And a lot of that, um, a lot of the dearth in retail is actually in our neighborhood nodes and corridors and our underserved markets. So the Temporium Project really sought to activate these ground level retail um, vacant spaces with um, with interesting things. Our first um, temporium happened on H Street Northeast. That's a really hot corridor right now. Um, we did our first project um, with about a, a twenty thousand dollar grant. It was it was a local local funds, um, and we made we started with our own space. We had a very difficult time trying to get. Um, private property owners to basically donate their space for free. So we don't. We started with our own project. So what you're looking at there is this library kiosk that's about 1,500 square feet that was decommissioned. So it, the program went, ran for four weekends um, in July and August of 2010. It had approximately 1,800 visitors, um, and it included. This had a fashion um, focus, and we used 20 local designers. And we had over $20,000 in sales in the four weekends. And again, it was just weekends, so um, Thursday through Sunday. And uh, most of the customers were in D.C. So that was our first foray, and that um, helped us kind of think bigger about what we could do. So when when the Art Place grant um, uh, initiated in 2011, we thought about the Temporum idea, but instead of having it be a focus on retail, we really thought about arts and culture, and we went after the Art Place grant. We received the $250,000 grant to do four arts and culture temporiums in emerging creative neighborhoods. We would transform vacant and underutilized storefronts and empty lots into artist showcases for three to six months. We worked in four neighborhoods. The neighborhoods um, were really diverse and sort of across the city. The four neighborhoods included Anacostia, um, which is in Ward 8 in the eastern part of the city. We also worked in Brookland, which is Ward 5. Um, we also worked um, in Deanwood, which is Ward 7. And we also worked on Upper 14th Street, which was Wards 1 and 4. Um, the geography crossed um, two, two wards. I'm only going to talk about two in the interest of time. Um, the Luminate um, Anacostia Project was our first one. Um, these, these four arts and culture temporiums ran... Um, some of them concurrently for three to six months in the summer of 2012. So from April to October, um, the four projects were going on um, simultaneously for the most part. Illuminate Anacostia um, was really um, the brainchild of our office, um, the D.C. Arts and Humanities Commission, which was a strong partner, and I'll mention them over and over again because they bring the arts programming and the arts expertise in terms of doing um, curating the art um, and we also always looked for a local partner on the ground in the neighborhoods. In this case, it was Arch Development Corporation. Arch Development is a 501c3 nonprofit whose sole focus is looking at arts and culture to drive neighborhood revitalization. So it was a slam dunk for us to work with Arch Development, and they had been doing some really interesting things in the neighborhood of Anacostia. And Anacostia, for folks who are not familiar with the district, it, it's, it's an area that's not often in the news for positive things. And um, this project really helped um, change the narrative and the public's viewpoint of what Anacostia is and what it could be. It also helped um, um, accelerate uh, the creative placemaking that was um, intrinsically taking place in the neighborhood. There are a number of galleries opening up. Arts, uh, Arch Corporation was managing a number of those galleries. But this grant allowed us to kind of ramp up the programming and kind of go a little bit larger to scale with some of the things that we were looking to do. The um, title Illuminate is based on the definition of illumination. Um, it's based on the, it's loosely based on the all night arts festival Nuit Blanche or White Nights in such cities as Paris and Toronto. The eight represents the location of where the event was held. Um, local and international artists and arts organizations um, participated in the historic event. This, um, what you're looking at right, right in front of you, is um, the old police evidence warehouse. And uh, we took over that space. It's about 220 square foot feet. 
um, empty space that was transformed. And I'll show you some images. Um, we also occupied about a half a dozen spaces along MLK uh, Road and Good Hope Road. So the issue in Anacostia and what we were trying to solve for was to activate um, the vacant space along the, the business strip and to also increase um, activity after, um, after work and in, the, and, and in the weekends. So that's what the project was hoping to do. Um, here are some images of the light box, which was the former police evidence warehouse. We turned it into the light box. We had a curator. Um, in addition to the arts and humanities, we partnered with um, some other local organizations that brought really strong programming as well as events programming to the space. Our partner, um, our arts and humanities, had a concurrent um, project going on called Five by Five Public Art. Um, project. It was the first time in the city that they were going with, it basically was 25 public art installations. And we were able to get two to three um, in Anacostia and really sort of really upped the art, um, the art ambition of the, of the Luminate Festival. What you're looking at here is sort of what it looked like at night. We were able to kind of light up the sky and, and the neighborhood for the weekend, the opening weekend and the closing weekend. And you're seeing sort of where Arch does its work in a, in a, in a gallery, Gallery O, right there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the impacts of, of the Luminate Festival because they were very big. And we had, um, you know, some naysayers, you know, that didn't think that this festival was going to really make a difference. And these were local people that are like, you know, the Office of Planning should be focused on sort of affordable housing and, you know, the, the, the typical stuff in which we do. Um, but this festival, we thought, was really important to kind of help change the narrative of what the neighborhood could be. And um, we really thought that making this investment would, would help um, residents feel better about where they lived and also um, attract additional uh, visitors um, to the area that had never really given Anacostia thought. So on the opening night, we had great promotion and buzz. Between 3,500 and 5,000 people attended on opening night. A lot of them took Metro and walked from the subway. We had great signage and there were um, programs and uh, we had you know, people out in full force to kind of let folks know what was happening. Anacostia's um, restaurants had their highest grossing single night ever on the opening night of um, Luminate. We provided over $25,000 in grants to DC-based artists, 66% of whom were east of the river, which was Ward 7 and 8 where the event was taking place. Um, we accomplished the goal of keeping Anacostia active on the weekends and during the business hours. And we also um, had some big things happen after. After that event, the H Street Playhouse, uh, which was looking for space as, their, um, as a result of participating in uh, Luminate, decided to move over to Anacostia. It's now called the Anacostia Playhouse, and it's actually um, right next to that um, old uh, police evidence warehouse. There was another one. They're currently occupying that space. A year later, the deal was done, and um, they've, they're open for, for business. In addition, um, half of the dozen, about three to four of the vacant spaces that we used last year were leased up. So um, we did Luminate Anacostia again, again this year, um, without Art Place funding, but um, Arch Development Corporation believed so strongly in the project that they found um, funds to keep it going. And hopefully it's an, an annual event for the community. And a lot of the um, community residents that were a little bit skeptical at first really sort of got on board, participated in a lot of the, the projects and the events happening over the three months and are some of the biggest proponents. I'm going to talk, um, shift gears a little bit and, and talk about uh, another project, um, the Central 14th Street plan. Um, this was an active planning um, neighborhood plan that was going on in our office. We used the Art Place grant to actually start plan implementation. Um, our office um, typically uh, doesn't do implementation, and we've been looking to try to to, to make our plans be more relevant and more meaningful. And we had an opportunity with Art Place to kind of jumpstart the implementation uh, with an ongoing active plan, uh, planning process. The small area plan or neighborhood plan priorities were or are uh, enliven retail to encourage patrons, create active, walkable, safe streets, increase connectivity between con uh, commercial nodes as well as east-west multimodal transportation options, and ensure more green areas for public space. Um, in this project, we partnered with Arts and Humanities Commission again, 
Um, and we also went um, national with uh, the Rebar Group. The Rebar Group is based out of San Francisco. They're um, doing a lot with art, design, and the intersection of the two. And um, they were really interested in doing a project in Washington. Um, we, we chatted with them, we talked about the neighborhoods, and this one really sort of emerged as a, a, a project where we could kind of test ideas in the plan and, and build support for the active planning process before it got to council. So briefly, um, what Rebar did, and we also had a local partner, I shouldn't, I should mention them. They were a nascent um, merchant association that had newly formed, and so they were sort of looking to make a mark themselves. And we never go into neighborhoods where we don't have um, a strong local partner or a partner that can help us on the ground in terms of buy-in with community support. In this instance, it was the Uptown Business Association, and it included a lot of the merchants that were participating in this um, design intervention. So. Really briefly, um, they, uh, we did three or four catalytic events um, with Rebar. The first one really looked at reimagining Colorado Avenue as a public plaza. So we actually closed off the street for the day, or, and we, um, we, we looked at what the plan said, which was um, you know, the, the, the Colorado Triangle area has the potential to be a unique arts cluster with a sense of place in the public realm. Um, the, the design intervention here was the, the mock-up where we actually did some um, painting of the plaza. We had some temporary seating. We did some landscape um, improvements to the area. And I have to say, as um, from a planning perspective, when you actually are doing projects on the ground, you invite a totally different um, group of people um, to your process, and we were able to attract people just by them walking by saying, hey, you know, what's going on on this Saturday? You close off the street, you know, get a, get a paintbrush, you know, start helping out. And we talked about the plan, but that wasn't the main goal. The main goal was sort of to build community and um, help residents understand what was happening. And through the course of that, we had boards of the plan, you know, get people interested in sort of the larger planning process. So this Art Place project actually um, helped broaden the coalition for the plan because it was people who were interested in actually doing and not necessarily just thinking about or, or brainstorming about a plan in the abstract, but they were seeing something tangible about what we meant by public infrastructure investments and what it could look like. Uh, with that, um, so the, the, the design intervention here was temporary street furniture, and the temporary street furniture, what is is the art. So the art being created was this. Um, we did a design charrette um, the same day we did that Colorado Plaza um, mock-up. A little bit later in the afternoon, we used a local artist's loft space um, that lived in the neighborhood to hold the design charrette. The, the, the design charrette was really different in the sense that it was roll up your sleeves and make stuff. It wasn't like whiteboards and what do you think? It was actually tell us, show us, what you want to see. So it was really cool. I mean, from a, from a planner's perspective, I had actually never been to a design charrette quite like that before, and it was really, really interesting. And what we heard loud and clear is that people did not, some of the issues there were with loitering. So the furniture that was created wasn't anything that was permanent, that was installed in the sidewalks, but it was actually stuff that you could take in and out. And so we ended up creating um, approximately 30 pieces of temporary furniture um, that could be used and seen by various storefronts um, in and along the public realm um, throughout the corridor. The furniture could be easily moved and shared amongst the businesses. Um, we decided on temporary um, on the street furniture because of the depth of the sidewalks, and we also wanted to um, drive visibility of the local businesses, and we thought that the street furniture was a good way to kind of pique residents and passerby's interest to actually the storefronts that we were trying to increase the foot traffic. So that was um, the, the design build workshop happened later, um, design build workshop and installation. So the pieces were prefabricated, but we actually took it to the street. We didn't actually, we, what you see here is the furniture being painted and made right there on the street. We took a week in July and we um, had a storefront space just for, um, for materials, but we rented it out an empty storefront. People didn't realize, you know, what it was. And we actually created this stuff out on the, 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 the public realm. And it generated a lot of interest and buzz about the project and the process. So again, the visibility factor, the cool factor was pretty high. 
The last event that I'm going to talk about is, uh, you know, we ended it. So the, this project started in April and ended in um, August, September. And between the e, uh, three events that Rebar led, um, we had the local organization do programming um, as well every uh, week with arts, mainly jazz concert series, um, some spoken word, what have you, um, after the furniture was created. It culminated into this open kitchen culture crawl, which basically uh, the, the issue here was repositioning this corridor to benefit from Columbia Heights, which was it's a neighborhood that has a lot of recognition. It's a place that people like to go. It's a destination destination neighborhood. Right above it, though, was suffering. And um, there were a lot of um, uh, unique and individual businesses there, a lot of ethnic restaurants there, but nobody was really pat patronizing it. So the furniture, as well as this open, uh, open kitchen culture crawl, was meant to highlight the diversity of those businesses, and it's basically like a food and art and culture crawl. And what you see here, we worked with local artists to do this mural, which is right next to one of the businesses. You can see the furniture being utilized, and we we moved along the corridor. It was in the span of maybe eight blocks, and we kind of it was an outdoor kind of food party festival, and it really was unique and. Um, we had different types of artists participating, and it was really successful in highlighting the businesses. The businesses did really well, and they got a lot of um, recognition and, and, and visibility um, that they hadn't previously had. So I want to wrap up with just some, some themes um, or takeaways from our project. And really, um, we don't, with, with, with our creative placemaking, um, because our, our, our grants have been relatively small, we really think about impact. So everything is within the context of a planning process, whether it was the Creative DC Action Agenda that actually highlighted some neighborhoods that were ripe for um, creative placemaking, the small area plans that also spoke to um, the need for arts and cultural uses. We hit the ground running with some work that had already been, that our office had already undertaken. And with a temporary project that was really important because, um, you know, we, we had a short amount of time to kind of get these projects off the ground. So we weren't necessarily kind of just dropping in on the neighborhood and enforcing something on the neighborhood. That wasn't the case at all. These were things that had been called out, that had been identified. The neighborhoods welcomed us because it wasn't just talk, oh, you said this in a plan two years ago, but we were actually coming to them with a tangible event or product. And we partnered with strong local partners that kind of helped promote and market the events. So that was really key to our success um, in the neighborhoods. Um, in addition to partnering locally, um, the Office of Planning, we're not art curators. Um, you know, that's not my background. I don't want to be an expert in that, but I knew who to turn to to kind of bring the ambition, um, the high artistic um, value and kind of creativity um, for the neighborhood. So partnering with strong arts organizations was key. And we were a relatively new player um, in the arts um, community in D.C. And, you know, one of the lasting effects is now um, we look, they look at uh, creative placemaking a little bit differently, and they actually come and kind of talk to us about projects before they even start to implement them to make sure that, you know, it's going to resonate, to make sure that there's some basis for doing what they want to do. So um, that was a key connection that was made and a bridge, um, the intersection of the arts community, which is vast in D.C., as well as um, our, our focus on place and, and what might work there and what might not. Um, I'm going to end there by just saying that we, we received a second um, Art Place grant. It's uh, totally different from the first one. Um, it's going to come online um, next year, late next year, and it's around creative play space. And this time, um, we thought about um, where we had play deserts, where we were underserved regarding um, playgrounds, and um, also not just um, playgrounds for kids, but for adults. So this um, second round of Art Place funding is really looking at, um, it's for an innovative urban play space competition. It's a design competition um, to, to, to develop three to five um, urban play spaces where we have a dearth. And um, I can talk about that if you're interested after the presentation, but I want to turn it over to my colleagues to talk about their project in Boston. Thank you. So as Liz says, my name is Max McCarthy. I'm the executive director of Upham's Corner Main Street. This is Lori, um, program design lead at Design Studio for Social Intervention. We're two partners in a, in a uh, kind of a cross-sector 
um, initiative involving arts organizations, non-arts organizations, community-based organizations, business development organizations um, around supporting cultural economic development in, in the neighborhood of Upham's Corner. And predominantly, in what, which we'll talk about today, by really using creative ways of engaging folks from the neighborhood. Um, so our roles as, as organizations and some of the other roles of the, of the partners will sort of come out as we talk about our, our, our project here. Um, but I wanted to start first by, by uh, giving a little context for, um, for Upham's Corner, the neighborhood of Upham's Corner. So this picture is actually um, the storefront of my office. I have a, a storefront retail location office um, right in Upham's Corner. Upham's Corner is a retail district. It's got about 140, 150 um, businesses um, and in the neighborhood of Dorchester in, in Boston, for those who are familiar, actually really adjacent to the, new, the next mayor that's coming in in January. Um, it's got, a, it's got a, um, actually a big historic connection, so a couple of fun facts. Upham's Corner actually was the first supermarket ever in the nation was in Upham's Corner. Um, it was, has one of the oldest cemeteries in the, world, in the nation um, in Upham's Corner. Um, so it's got a big historic context. There's a lot of um, underutilized architecture and physical assets that we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, now it's actually an incredibly diverse neighborhood. It's actually got one of the largest Cape Verdean, Cape Verdean populations um, in the country. Um, it has a large Latino population, large African American population. So it's incredibly diverse. It's also sorry, my fault. <laughs> it's also incredibly young. So it's got a really high population of folks under 18. Um, so within that context, within this kind of this historic connection, a diversity in the neighborhood, a really young population, um, and the, kind of the diversity of the partners that are bringing things to the table. Um, it was sort of setting the scene for a, a kind of a creative placemaking intervention. Um, so a couple, um, couple key threads um, that links all this, a couple key values. I know I heard the conversation about values um, spoken a lot today. Um, one of the things that we really value in a lot of this is having uh, local residents, <coughs> local artists, and local businesses at the, really the forefront of everything we're doing. So creating opportunities for folks to engage, to, to collaborate, to learn, to participate, even lead. Um, a lot of the pop-up interventions, activities, and events that we're doing. Um, we really think that really helps sustainability, and, and aside from resources, really getting that community foundation is really important. Um, the, the initiative is basically run by community organizers, so that's really important to us. Uh, the other thing is about uh, being very intentional with um, the folks we're reaching out to. So artists, young people, folks who are often left out in neighborhood initiatives such, such as these. Um, so you know, young people, artists, businesses, uh, folks who don't speak English as the first language, being really intentional around um, uh, on reaching those folks who are often left out in, in um, kind of community initiatives like this. So this hub was, an, was a nice way, and we'll talk about some examples of how it's been used around folks to get information, learn, interact, engage. Um, and, uh, and, and Lori's going to talk some examples around how that's looked like. So. so we kicked it off with a public kitchen. And at the design studio, we believe that the public is still a work in progress, right? And that's part of what creative placemaking is about. Um, how do we imagine more affordable, more convivial spaces? And we thought, if we want to bring the community into this creative placemaking project, let's break bread together. So the public kitchen was imagining a new public infrastructure, like a public library, but what if there was such a thing? And having a partnership, some of the partnerships that came out of our place, like up on the corner of Main Street, we had that office as our space. And 500 residents came through, walking by foot traffic, came in, sat down with us, sat down with each other. And I think when we knew we had succeeded when a woman about my age convinced her mother that it really was OK to share her secret recipe um, that she had written and then thought about and then balled up and thrown away so that we, you know, she wasn't just sharing it with us or with up on the corner of Main Street. It was on the wall in our sharing recipe section, right, because she was sharing it with her community. Um, so. We had the chef from the, the homeless shelter across the street come over and make sure we were using gloves and we were serving healthy, safe food. Um, so we just had all kinds of things going on um, in the neighborhood. Uh, we had this young guy win our chef competition. Uh, we had worked on at the Dudley Greenhouse just down the street. Um, so again, just a way of getting, kicking it all off and really bringing the neighborhood together to start to think about what is this thing creative placemaking. So I, I a couple of some of the goals here going out real quick. I sort of mentioned the first two. Um, part, of, part of what I brought in as a, for those familiar with Main Streets, Main Streets is a non-arts organization by any means. We support businesses and um, business districts. Um, and so I'm sort of brought in to think about what are the, what are the economic development aspects and the, the strengths of, of, of this initiative. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit of how we use cultural events and activities to support artists and businesses in the neighborhood. Um, one quick thing I wanted to mention here um, is that 
you know, rooted in, in having resident leadership and, and business um, ownership is, is the idea around, um, you know, arts is often synonymous or can be synonymous with um, the idea of gentrification and using arts to sometimes flip a neighborhood. So we want to make sure that um, community stakeholders, the folks that would be directly impacted by changes in a neighborhood, right, have a seat at the table. And so we just want to be intentional and make sure we we're aware of that as we're doing this work. Um, Real quickly, uh, one of the first forays we, we've looked at, we actually have a theater in our neighborhood. Um, it's a 1,400-seat theater um, that attracts both kind of community-based events and, and events from Metro Boston. Um, and we've really thought about how do we leverage uh, audiences that are coming in for the local businesses. So we've sort of our, our collaborations on that have sort of ramped up throughout the Art Place grant. But um, um, things like dining guides, events where we actually brought businesses to the lobby and through Boston Ballet, where we actually had fashion businesses showcasing, promoting their work as, a, as audiences came in. We actually did a study with, with the Strand around looking at what its impact on local restaurants. And some, some businesses get double the amount of sales on an, on an evening night because sometimes around 6 or 7, there's, there's nothing else happening in the neighborhood. It shuts down because of crime um, and other issues in the neighborhood. Um, the other thing that's been a really interesting thing for me, a paradigm shift for the work that we do to support local businesses, is thinking about artists as businesses, right? So... You know, when we typically think about businesses, we're always thinking about brick and mortar businesses, businesses that have a storefront office. But there's a lot of kind of informal economy and folks who have businesses at home who are part of the neighborhood as well. Um, and so we work, we're working with a, a partner organization that specifically works, um, does technical assistance for cultural entrepreneurs. And that's been a really big paradigm shift for me and my organization, thinking about supporting artists who are part of the neighborhood but don't necessarily have a storefront office. So we've, this is an example of one of the events we did. We had a, a street festival, which... Merchants from the neighborhood have been clamoring for. We used to do it in the 90s and 2000s. It wasn't, wasn't able to be, uh, we weren't, weren't able to do it just because it got so big and so overwhelming. And we uh, closed down the street, had local artists, local vendors, local performers um, all come together and, and perform on a great Saturday afternoon. We actually worked with a, a team that analyzed the economic impact, and we found that it created 13, 000, over $13,000 in increased economic activity, both from people buying from local vendors as well as the spillover effects of people buying things around from different businesses in the neighborhood. So for some of these people, this could be double the amount of sales they get in a day. So um, this is a, a giant one-off event we do annually. We're currently piloting kind of a more regular version, like an open-air market type of thing, where folks can sell and sell things on a regular basis. So um, yeah, so um, I think that's basically a little behind. So. One of the things that we felt was really important in terms of engaging the community and thinking about their neighborhood and the arts and culture in their neighborhood was really bringing planning processes and conversations about the neighborhood out onto the street. A lot of times when, uh, no offense to Kimberly, a lot of times planners will hold a neighborhood meeting and they'll get like 20 people and they'll be like, check, neighborhood meeting, hell. Um, when we turned to artists to think about how do we creatively engage people in this conversation, we took art into the neighborhood in ways that made planning accessible and gave easy ways to, to weigh in. Um, and, and by that, we got literally hundreds of people weighing in. For example, um, there's a $3 million Department of Transportation plan for Upham's Corner, including a fence down the middle of the road. So uh, this artist, Cedric Douglas, who's a local artist, worked with us and created some signage in different ways to engage the community in thinking about that plan. And what would you do with $3 million? So we were able to both spread the word about the plan and indeed stop the, road, the, the fence going down the middle of the road. That plan was stopped. But also to capture data about what would people do with that money? And any time we capture data like that, when we think about impact and desire, we want to make sure that we're sharing it not just with funders and not just with planners, but also back to the community. So we always make sure that those things are public conversations, or if they're conversations people are having with us, that we make, that, make those uh, answers public. Having um, the hub, having Upham's Corner Main Street as a way to engage people on the street. Again, both through public kitchen, where we are cooking with people, talking with people, and through making planning processes public. Again, using some creative artistic approaches as well as having installations literally out on the street meant that people could really access planning, no matter if they came back with their 14 books about the history of planning in Upham's Corner, which did happen, or they were 10 years old and they're weighing in on what creative thing they wanted in that large building that isn't being used. Um, coming out of making planning processes public and hearing what people wanted for the neighborhood, we decided to do Street Lab Upham's, which was taking a tactical urbanism approach to really engaging residents and merchants and local artists in transforming small public spaces around Upham's Corner. Um, so this was one of the spaces that we transformed. The alley in the top left, that's how it looked. We gave, um, the first day we were out, we had photos of a lot of spaces around Upham's Corner. What did people want? And people wanted to make that alley, again, 
Um, to the merchants nearby, it was nasty. It smelled of urine. To the pedestrians, they could no longer get to their neighborhood from Upham's Corner because it was a scary, smelly alley. Um, we had a magnet board where people could say, this is what I want. I love that, the colors on the steps, or we need lights, or we need um, you know, merchants here. And from that, we ended up over a course of six Saturdays creating you know, a mural on the steps. We have the, some beautiful knit work that some knitters and local folks learning to knit created as a railing. Um, a local artist got to show their work in the, in the, in the alley gallery. Um, so again, we've heard about it a lot today, but that idea of temporary installations and temporary art to point to what's possible and to be in a conversation with people about what they want. Um, having the, the neighbors and merchants make that happen meant that even once this is gone, they might say, you know what, I remember that bench, I want to build a bench, or I want to hook up th this other alley that they didn't get to, I'm going to hook up with somebody and make that happen. And, and part, of, part of these sort of these temporary installations are also about, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, using creative ways of engaging people, right? So you know, your typical way is like have a meeting, people come to a meeting and then they sort of give their opinions, but this is actually kind of a feedback loop to get, we had a, we had a, month, we had a uh, regular advisory committee of, of residents, merchants, artists that came together and, and looked at kind of the higher level planning of arts and culture in the neighborhood. And these were creative ways of touching those folks, the street fair, the, um, these installations. So, so again, it's sort of a feedback loop. And you know, how are you creatively looking at engaging people? So, That's, We can hit that right back. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, so, OK. Sorry, we zipped right. through it a little bit. We're a little behind. But. Um, I was going to sort of have a discussion among the panelists and then, and then take some questions. I'm going to head that off a little bit um, and try to consolidate what, what we're going to do. Um, so for one thing that, that I kind of want to point out, um, that was being discussed by, by these folks uh, is the, the kinds of everything that we're talking about metrics and what kinds of things you know are metrics for places changing. I think like a lot of the stuff that they were just talking about as, as people invested in place and as trying to change places, like whether it's the retail, whether it's the activity, whether it's you know these sort of physical things, the, the street furniture, those kinds of things are all potential sort of um, you know ways to, to measure impact. I do want to make a quick note, um, because both of these projects are sort of very, um, not, I wouldn't, well, there's similarities, but it's, you know, they're sort of, they're very um, based out of this, this certain types of models. This is not all that creative placemaking is. Um, it doesn't have to sort of have this, this approach. Um, you know, there's a whole wide range of strategies. But again, I wanted to bring these strategies because I felt like we were going to talk a lot about other arts-based creative placemaking strategies. So this, this is really, um, I think, um, interesting to hear the sort of, uh, again, when, when these folks started these projects, what, what were they trying to achieve? They're trying to achieve um, certain things within the context of the neighborhood around um, activation and merchants and, and things like that. And I think one of my favorite quotes, I did a site visit with Upham's Corner about a month ago, um, and you guys may remember that one of my yep. favorite parts was this, this businesswoman who's been yep. in Upham's Corner for 30 yeah. years, 40, yeah. 50 years. I she's don't know. a resident. In, yeah. She's a resident, and she owns a building, and she owns a business in Upham's Corner. Insurance Corner. broker. And she, she's an insurance broker. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so not like an artist. Um, <laughs> and she came out to talk to us, and she was like, the air has changed. You know, things are changing. She was going to leave, right? And then, and because there was this, there's been this sort of injection of vitality and, and action and, um, and the, the things that this sort of arts-based programming has, um, has brought to the picture, she's really excited to stay where she is and explore what's possible in Upham's Corner. Um, I want to go back to those questions I asked um, before, um, before the, uh, the presentations. Um, one, sort of what, what are some of the things that the arts bring um, uniquely to, to, this, to these kinds of strategies? Um, I think um, the ability to bring people together, the ability to vision and vision what's possible, um, and sort of the ability to change the configuration and the meaning of a space um, and giving people the opportunity to experience what it means to change um, public space, which I think is often um, feels to many people like a static thing that they have no control over. So what happens um, using, you know, by getting, you know, letting people get their hands dirty with, with these things, um, both in temporary and permanent ways, I think is really interesting. Um, I think... Uh, both of the programs involve both the arts as they happen. I think one element of Upham's Corner that we didn't get into is, is the role of the Strand Theater, mm -hmm. um, which is this sort of central old theater uh, in the middle of Upham's Corner that, um, you know, there's a whole new wave of programming and activity happening in the theater that's um, 
sort of providing this synergy between what's happening outside of the theater and then all of the new activities of what's going on inside of the theater. Um, and so it's both a combination of sort of using the arts as a tool, but also um, planning activity um, and, and sort of newness around the, the arts that are already happening. Um, so, uh, and then I think, you know, what are there different kinds of, of outcomes and impacts? You know, there, again, there's a sort of psychological, the hope. I love that question, you know, how do you measure hope? Um, you give people something to be hopeful about. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, I think that that's a really important piece of this work. Um, and then just the growing sense of cohesion and connection around a place. Um, that that these um, these are this is literally place making. Um, yeah, I just tell a quick story extended with the, the, the business yeah. owner. So you know we were talking about speaking of evaluation and metrics. Um, we were talking about the sort of the economic impact. You know, she's like me, I think in numbers are always like, oh look, Linda, like look at all these numbers we got from all this the economic impact of these special events. And she's like, yeah, that's great, but you know, and she she said this to me, and I always I I use it now. But um, she said it's not just about the money, but it's also about how rooted you feel to a place. And, and she said, um, you know, it, it, you're, particularly when there's turnover with businesses, how, how people feel connected to a place is, is just as important as the money. And I was like, wow, that was really deep. And I had never thought about it that way. And so, and, uh, and, you know, that was an insurance broker who really has no arts background whatsoever. So I just want to, on the, on, the, on the, we're always talking about how it's hard to quantify these things. And I always think about mentalities and the conversations I have with businesses and merchants who've been there for years and are finally now starting to reinvest in their building and, and things like that. So just I, want to add that. I was going to say, too, we're, we were um, having a lot of interviews on the street when people would come over to Street Lab Uplands and talking to them about vibrancy in some ways, maybe some words that made more sense, or asking them what words made sense to them, um, kind of what are their hopes and fears for Uplands and where do they feel like they belong. And again, you know, I think we're learning from them what the narrative is and also thinking about how do we change the narrative without changing the population. Right. Um, so our next step on that is to capture those one-on-one -on -one conversations, which were tremendously positive. People really proud about the diversity of Uplands, as well as sad about the reputation of Uplands. And, and to say, um, taking, again, Max's storefront and then some of the other businesses we've built relationships with and say, let's put those quotes up on the windows so that people are having conversations with each other. And so that narrative is changing organically around the street from, from responses to those conversations. So um, the question, I'm going to wrap um, a few of the questions that I wanted to ask sort of in together in one. Um, what, is, what is different about the work that you're doing um, because you've added an artistic lens? And what did the Art Place grant, um, and, and not necessarily just because it was an Art Place grant, but, but what, did, what did sort of taking this framework of the artistic um, driver of, of sort of placemaking, how did that um, change, or what would have happened, or what do you think would have happened without that framework? You know, what has what, what, what this added to the work that, that you're doing? Um, I don't know if either one of you wants to start. I'll, I'll start. Um, so with us, um, with Office of Planning, uh, it really did help um, us jumpstart plan implementation. And uh, again, typically, we don't have uh, money in our budget for plan implementation. And the Art Place grant, you know, they were uh, small catalytic investments that really actually helped um, build a broader coalition for the planning process. Um, and with the Central 14th Street example, that was an active planning process. And so by the time we got to council, we had um, broader, much more support than we um, would have had had we not done the intervention. I didn't mention, um, but in all of the projects, um, the council members came out, supported the plan. I mean, this was, and we did a lot of marketing and promotion and also kind of talking about the advantages. So it, it really gave us um, a way to kind of move faster um, what we were trying to do and to kind of show what was possible in a very sort of tangible way um, with, with, with our placemaking efforts. And in each of the neighborhoods, um, the others, the other three didn't have an active planning um, engagement, but they did have um, strong um, neighborhood groups that were interested in, in moving forward in this type of, of dialogue. So, you know, it was, it was tremendously impactful and helpful for us. So just a quick follow up question, and then I'm going to let you guys go. Um, so would you say that the, the arts piece of it, specifically the arts aspect of the work, was showing people what's possible in that tangible way? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just wanted to call Absolutely. That out. Yeah. So I'd say the, the Art Place grant catalyzed relationships and brought down barriers between organizations that typically don't work together. So, you know, I'm, I have to repeat, I'm not an arts organization at all. You know, we, we 
we, we, we thought about using arts to do look at re neighborhood revitalization. And so that's led us to form some partnerships and relationships with other organizations that can help us do that. So I think that's what, that's what really helped. And those, those relationships and that thinking will really sustain. The other thing I think it's been really cool for me is, I was telling some people here earlier, is that thinking about arts, I guess, not capital A, but lowercase a. So thinking about, you know, there's always the, the typical sense around arts, you know, like performing arts and visual arts. But there's also the, the, the you know, the, the restaurant owner who has a culinary art, a really unique thing about them that makes them, that, that's part of the identity of a neighborhood. Or it's someone who, just, who does something at home, makes, makes does photography, or, or makes um, soaps. We have people that work with soaps. So um, broadening the definition. And, and then, because I also think that when you look at thinking about arts, it, it's sometimes intimidating for people to think about if they don't think, see themselves as artists. Um, and then the last point I'll say is um, bringing on, it's been great working with, uh, with artists, not just because of the, the art they produce, but also a kind of a creative perspective on things that I don't have, an entirely new perspective on things. So I want to pull out one piece of this, yep. too, the, the, the idea of partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the idea that we, I know that we don't think that all arts and all artists should do yep. placemaking, and mm -hmm. I, that it should come naturally. You know, right. and I think this is why we include partnerships in the definition and when we talk about creative placemaking, um, because, you know, certainly there are people that have dual competencies. I mean, Waterfire has a really great dual competency, I think, in the place piece and in the arts piece. Um, but to the extent that you we want to um, help foster partnerships between uh, arts and non-arts and arts and place people, really, so that the arts can do what, what you do best and, and what, um, you know, what to really bring out that, that sort of, again, that sort of value proposition of, of, of everything without having to divert necessarily um, to, to sort of get engaged in all these placement issues. And if you can do both, that's great, too. Um, but, you know, if you're feeling like I, I'm still not sure how to make what I do into placemaking, I think one of the first things you can do is go talk to somebody in the community who's doing placemaking work to think about, well, how can, um, how can we align our agendas or how can we align our activity over here and what you're trying to do over here um, to, to basically uh, enhance and, and build on momentum that's already happening. Um, so I think there's, there's sometimes, you know, when we're sitting there and we're thinking especially about grant applications and we're like, how do I shoehorn this in? And like it, it's not necessarily about shoehorning it in. It's about um, working in tandem with and in collaboration with and in alignment with um, other things that, that are happening to help contribute to that larger outcome, um, which I think is an, an important point. Thanks. Um, so my question to the panelists is, how are you implementing and or funding um, maintenance and clean and safe and staffing for the implementation of these Please programming? Speak up. Sorry, I can't really hear Sorry, you. sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, how are you implementing and funding maintenance for the clean and safe and or the staffing and or the long-term um, protection of these, these great public interventions, i.e. through business improvement districts or volunteers or <coughs> public safety, police departments? I mean, how are you? How are they, ma how are they maintained, the temporary? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it is a challenge, and I think that's one of the reasons why they, we've tended to go towards temporary structures, because the level of uh, the cost that it would take to create permanent city furniture, you know, say, as an example, you know, and as well as the relations it would take and the, the sort of permits you'd need to have are a different scale than working with a community to say, you know what, we need a bench at this bus stop, and we're just going to build a bench at this bus stop, and we're going to have it there until it gets taken away. Um, so a little bit more guerrilla style, a little bit more like, how could you create change here if you wanted to? Um, a little bit like Kimberly was showing up, it's prefab, but you're out here painting it with us, and you're a part of it, and it might not be here next time. And if it's not here, then maybe you're thinking, I should make something to be here. And one thing I'll add, too, on the Street Lab Upham, we, we actually had a, a business, that uh, a hair salon next to the alley that had basically adopted one of the benches that we had created. She br brings it in and out every night. So it gets back to, I mean, I think the... It's, it's community ownership of what, what you're actually doing. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, that's, that's messy, and I'm not going to lie that it's like perfect every time. But when, when it works, when you have a really strong process and really being um, really upfront with how that, can, how that <coughs> can work and work well, then it, and it, that's where you can get the ownership, and, and it's less reliant on us or anyone else, but the people who are directly benefiting from it. Yeah, so. 
Hey, thanks. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, if you're receiving a, a one-time large inf uh, infusion of cash through a, through a project support Sorry. grant, uh, through a project support grant, uh, what are some strategies for, uh, for sustainability? So in thinking about future years that you'll want to continue the projects, uh, what are some, some strategies at the local level or, or from our place in trying to keep these projects going? Um, I'll, I'll respond to that. Uh, with what we've done in DC, um, we had local match um, for the art place grant. That wasn't a requirement, but we thought that that was uh, really critical for the sustainability factor um, for um, the projects and the momentum. So um, we, we had in-kind support from the Arts and Humanities Commission that we, we leveraged a, a, a concurrent project of theirs, and then OP kicked in dollars. Um, and in terms of sustainability, I think that the, the planning framework um, that we were operating in and all of the communities actually helped push that forward as well because with the Central 14th Street plan, the plan went to council, it was adopted. Some of the public realm improvements are actually now part of the capital improvement, facility, uh, capital improvement plan like in the Department of Transportation. So there was actually some real um, momentum that was, uh, that was achieved through the small um, uh, temporary intervention that actually led to real dollars being put into the respective agency budgets um, to help some of the plan come um, in online a little bit sooner than it, it, it probably would have. And the other neighborhoods, what happened was there was capacity building with each of the neighborhood organizations that we worked with. There was some capacity. All of the organizations basically hadn't done a project of that scale and magnitude before, so it raised the level in which they were operating, and some of them attracted additional support um, after Art Place was done. The Central 14th Street community, um, they had an advisory committee as part of the plan. The, the nonprofit that was just getting off the ground actually received some te uh, technical assistance through another program around vibrant retail streets. So it's, it was... This, this Art Place grant is kind of the gift that keeps on giving, even though the projects were temporary in each of the neighborhoods. And with Brooklyn, which I didn't even talk about, it was a dance organization. Well, it actually fundamentally changed how they thought about programming. Instead of just coming to their space, they actually do much more programming out in the neighborhood and in the public realm as a result of the Art Place grant. And it actually... Um, it generated more uh, funders and supporters to the organization because they were visible, not just to the dance community, but to the actual neighborhood that they were operating in. And for us, briefly, I'd say we split the grant among nine partners, which was really complicated, and sometimes we wanted to kill each other or ourselves. Um, but when we went back to the table just recently, because we're talking about are we going to uh, reapply, it was really interesting because every partner was like, well, you know, I'm here at the Berkeley School of Music, and they're thinking about leveraging this and bringing this. And I'm here at Jose Mateo Dance Theater, and we're in connection with this grant, this funder. So people are really trying to say um, whether or not we get the grant, if we're in this together in Upham's Corner, what, what else do we bring to the table? And that's been helpful. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that we're hoping to help build sort of local movements, <laughs> um, you know, I think the, the more that uh, to thinking about the funding is coming from many different sectors because there's um, a multi-sector impact that's happening. Um, I think it's one way to look at it. Of course, we'd love to, you know, give 10-year grants and, and have massive, large projects, you know, and, and, and there's, you know, a lot more that, um, you know, our structure, you know, I think it would be, you know, be nice to have that flexibility. But I think to the idea of using um, these grants as a, a catalyst to do that kind of capacity building, capacity building while you're simultaneously um, executing the project um, and thinking about fund, thinking about the sustainability of funding from the very beginning is actually really critical. And it's something that we actually look at when we review full applications and, and how, how much um, that's sort of considered um, and certainly going outside of you know, the traditional arts sector, because like we're, we're not here to take money from the art sector and put it over here. We're, we're here to help um, create a bigger pie overall. Um, that's just sort of a, a big statement. And I think, um, you know, sort of an important uh, way to look at it. So again, I, I think I just want to uh, just reiterate that this is not the only kind of creative placemaking that we do and that we fund and that's important. Um, this is just sort of, again, one slice to complement the other kinds of, uh, you know, sort of performing arts or, uh, 
or the um, other kinds of community animation and community engagement projects that, that we fund. Um, and I, I urge you, if you haven't um, and you're interested in Art Place, to go on our website. There's a new page, um, Art Place America slash resources, that sort of brings together some of the main things, um, principles of creative placemaking, more about the vibrancy indicators if you're interested. Um, there's a PDF that lists all of the grants that we've made with short little blurbs on them. And sometimes just doing that helps think about how, um, how we think you know, what we've supported and how people have framed that. So that's one final thing. So with that, um, I will end. I want to thank everybody um, for your vast attention. It was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, we'll be around.